Good day gentlemen, James Marshall here. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing an idea which is pretty prevalent, being pushed by a lot of men's and masculinity coaches at the moment, relating to what are the metrics that make the difference in terms of being attractive to women. And it seems to boil down to three, and three only, specific metrics that if you are high on them, then you will get mad puss forever. And if you're low on them, you'll be getting none. What are they? Looks, money, status. That's it. That's it. Nothing to do with your personality, with your skills, with your charisma, with your confidence. None of that. Are you six foot three and jacked and have a chiseled jaw? Do you have mills in the seal, ceiling? And uh, was the other one? Status. And do you have Instagram photos of you on a boat and like frozen with that, that look of like, I'm saying that thing. And then the four girls around you are like, I can't believe he said that thing. I'm so going to fuck that guy because of his mad status and muscles and money. Perhaps you can tell by my mildly sarcastic delivery that I don't agree with this, although there may well be some truth to it. Let's dive into the muscle money status game and see if it trumps the seductive game. There's a scene from the iconic 80s movie Scarface, if you haven't seen it, Come on, it's fucking awesome. Say hello to my little fuck on for you look like you ain't been fucked in it. So many good lines, what an amazing movie. And there's a scene early on where Scarface, can't remember his real name, and his buddy, can't remember his name, let's call him Ricky Ricardo, uh, are by the pool in Miami and they talk about chicks, about how, you know, how do you get chicks? And uh, his buddy says, I'll just show you. And he strides over in his tight 70s swimwear to some blonde bombshell like 70s OnlyFans chick and runs a bit of mad game and then I think she like throws a drink at him or like goes there's no way why don't you come back when you're running an extremely big drug empire and then I'll fuck you and uh, gets blown out goes back to Scarface and Scarface says the iconic line something along the lines of first you get the hang on which one was it first first you get the money money then you get the power status looks doesn't matter then you get the women. Watching this, it occurred to me that this is the debate that still goes on today. Here's the, the smug gangster watching his buddy fail on the one approach that he did. And she's like, no way, tall, extremely handsome and charismatic Cuban guy. I'm not interested in your bold approach. I only, wanna, I only want the money. Fast forward to today, we see plenty of men's influencers basically spouting the same kind of stuff. Get your money straight. You need to be more plates to get more dates. Uh, and that this ephemeral kind of idea of status, which I think there's a very reductive and simplistic idea of what it means. It's based around this image that you see on, on Instagram of apparently wealthy looking dudes in glamorous locations, on boats, in exclusive clubs, uh, you know, in the Hamptons and whatever, with more girls than there are guys, popping bottles of champagne, again, with that look of like, I can't believe I just said that awesome ball of line that everyone loves, but mainly they love my status. And no surprise, this is mostly tied to people who are trying to sell you a get rich quick scheme, right? Because the idea being don't, there's nothing you can do. You are a loser, essentially. Like you don't yet, you don't fit up to a certain benchmark in looks. You are not earning six, seven figures a year and you're not positioned in this specific social scene, then you're out of the game. And it's provable by the fact that this guy is not getting dates. And so if it was just to improve these specific metrics, coincidentally enough, by signing up to my multi-level marketing scheme or uh, drop shipping business, or I'll teach you how to be a business coach based on my one business, which is teaching people how to be business coaches and so on. Uh, let's say probably deliberately obscuring what are the real realities of what makes the difference in terms of being attractive to women. So before I get into countering or trashing this idea, we should ask the question, is there any credence, is there any legitimacy to this idea at all? Uh, is it that looks, money, status don't matter at all? And there would be people who would tell you that, particularly early days, uh, dating coaches, seduction coaches, that'd be like, doesn't matter if you are you know, four foot six, overweight, broke, living at home with your parents, uh, have never had sex with a girl before. If you do these six lines in a row, then you will get supermodels. Right, so there would be the, the other side of that where we're saying that it's simply related to a specific memorized skill set, a bunch of lines essentially that have been you know, generated by the CIA to psychologically manipulate people into bed or whatever. So I don't agree with that, but on the other, other side, 
just focusing in on these metrics is not going to matter. But do they matter at all? Yes. And to what extent? Do looks matter? Yes, indeed they do. I've been teaching men for over a decade out on the streets, taking men of all shapes and sizes and looks and seeing what happens when they roll up to strangers, approach women on the street. And without a doubt, if the guy is above average height and above average attractiveness, then he will get better responses overall or on average than a guy who is much lower in those metrics. However, the differences are not massively stark. There will be some girls who will just like the guy on site because he's a pretty boy. Uh, she'll make it a bit easier on him, but he still needs to actually have the skill set and the confidence to move through with this. I've had plenty of guys who are very attractive men and have had no women running after them throughout their life. The, they, got the, they had the looks and many of them got the money and you know, to some degree status in whatever world they live in. And then the women didn't just mysteriously appear because women don't do that. It's very, very rare for a woman to chase a man. He would have to be of such an extreme level of high status, we're talking you know, A-lister in whatever field he's in, uh, to even have that as a possibility of happening. And even within those echelons, I've taught many men who are seven, eight figure guys, some famous, some aristocrats, uh, very well positioned in party scenes in big cities like New York and so on, and still get no results or worse results than a guy who just has a normal life but has actually developed skills and, and approach abilities. So yes, looks can have an effect. You may get less resistance. You may get more kind of invitation offers and girls may make it easier on you if you are pleasing to the eye. But one of the good things about being a man is that there is not only a single beauty standard. A man can be sexy even if he has a bit of a dad bod uh, or if he's a bit under height of the average or if he doesn't have the perfectly chiseled jaw. As long as he presents himself well, and what does that mean? Looks after his hygiene, is well groomed, is well dressed, fitting to his age and to his social demographic or his subculture, moves and expresses himself with grace and confidence and clarity, and has a sense of his own version of masculine presence about him, then he can be a very attractive and appealing man to most women. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't spend any time or effort into improving your looks. For sure, if you're overweight, then go to the gym, diet well, and give, get yourself a trimmer figure. You do not need to be jacked. This is a myth. Many women don't like very massive dudes. Of course, you know, the Brad Pitt body in Fight Club, which is kind of the defining, like every dude wants that body. Uh, sure, if, we all, if, if you had that, it's gonna be an advantage. Um, but destroying yourself for many years in the gym in order to get to a certain level of size in your muscles or cutness in your fat rates or whatever is going to give you very small returns in terms of uh, what you're going to get from women because it's based around the idea of like you know building this pretty G.I. Joe figure and then what? Stand there and then expect that girls are going to go wow that guy's got an amazing chisel body I'm going to go and take all the action and do the seduction on his behalf. No, again, I've taught so many dudes. Most dudes now are pretty jacked. Most guys, you know, go to the gym and they've got decent looking bodies or sometimes really amazing bodies. Cool, like in conjunction with a whole bunch of other factors, then a woman might be like, and my guy is fucking jacked. Cool, but, but that is not gonna be enough in and of itself. So sure, put F into that because it feels good to be healthy and you'll look better and you'll fit clothes better. Okay, cool, these are things that will increase your passive value, but it is not the main thing. In the modern era, this idea has extrapolated out into the idea of looks maxing, and sometimes this goes to pretty extreme lengths where guys are getting plastic surgery to you know, break their jaw to make it jut out more, or get nose jobs, or do stuff to their eyes to get those hunter eyes. Do I have hunter eyes? I don't know, maybe. Of course, this is a personal decision. You know, some, For some person, getting work done, getting plastic surgery done, maybe something that really fixes an area of their self-esteem. Okay, you know, if it's really necessary or if it's something that you feel is really going to make a difference to the way you perceive yourself, um, okay, not something I would definitely recommend. However, the one corrective procedure that I have seen a bunch of my clients do recently and it works is hair replacements. So yes, being, you know, going bald, young especially, being a balding man is not you know, not necessarily a sexy prospect. Can men look good with a shaved head? Yes, depending on the shape of the head. I do not, I look like kind of like an ostrich with a shaved head. I did it back when I was a Shaolin monk. But you know, plenty of guys look decent with it. But the hair replacements 
really do work. I'm not selling, pitching this or selling this or getting any commissions, but I've seen a bunch of guys mostly go to Turkey. Um, do your research, don't go to some backyard um, hair replacement doc. But yes, they seem to be able to like take the follicles now from the back of your head and stick it on. And then I've seen clients go from like balding dudes to like, wow, they've got a full head shock of hair and it looks lovely. So, you know, if that's, if that's, that's an issue for you, go ahead, get your hair back, no worries. But with that being said, I think it's really important not to fixate on this area because there are a lot of things that you can't necessarily change. You can't change your height unless you do that weird thing they do in Korea where they break their bones and extend them and stick bits of metal in there. Do not do that, please. That's really not going to be good for you in your old age. Your face shape, your ethnicity, sometimes your body type, right? These can be things that you just have to work, work around. And the reality is, because I've seen it thousands of times on the street, is there are so many women who are interested in dating a wide range of guys. Yes, there are beauty standards. Yes, there are some guys who get it much easier because of the way, what they, the body they were born into. But if you're of average height, average looks, what matters way more is that you have a look, you have a style, that you present to the world in a way that is confident and direct and expressive. And then what's going to be vastly more important is how you actually interact with the world, your ability to communicate, your ability to arouse, to excite, to entertain, to show presence, to hold space for somebody, to listen, uh, to be fun to be around, to be kind, to be interesting, uh, to pull the trigger, to lead, to be good at fucking. All these things are the ones that actually make the big difference in the broader scheme of things. Next up is money. You gotta be rich if you went and get chicks. First you get the money, remember? First money, then comes power. I was thinking about that. Me and my friends did it in exactly the opposite, right? So we reversed the Scarface uh, paradigm. We were like, first we got the women, we were totally broke and just fucking spent all day chasing chicks and living off the doll or you know, our odd jobs doing massage or DJing or whatever. So first we got the chicks, then we got the power because we noticed that when we had girls around us that other guys thought that we were cool and they would invite us to parties and give us business advice and then we started to you know, build status and then we got some money <laughs> after all of that because then people started paying us to teach them how to get chicks when we were broke in the first place. There are different, you can mix it up, there's other ways to do it. Anyway, back to money, is it important? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that having a certain amount of resources is going to hamper you, it's going to basically cripple your ability to get what you want in life and to interact with women if you have a certain lack of it. After a certain point, it just becomes kind of a neutral thing where it's not really of any effect at all. And then if you get your money straight and become rich, really rich, then at some point where your wealth is visible and it gives you power and leverage over space and time, then yeah, it might have some effect again. Although often not the effect that you would necessarily want. If you are so broke that you can't dress in a way that's presentable, uh, although being like there is a broke aesthetic as well. I used to wear ripped jeans and Converse and uh, you know like an army jacket and things that were kind of thrifty. And there's there's worlds where that's cool. So it's you don't have to wear boss stuff. I mean boss Armani stuff. And please don't actually. It's I think it's generally tacky to plaster any kind of brand name across you or to buy based on brand my personal opinion. So yes, if you're unable to you know, pay for basic dates, you can't pay for a coffee, you can't pay for transport or you don't have transport, you're in, a, in an area where public transport doesn't exist, you need a car and you don't have one, uh, and you can't afford Ubers or whatever, you can't go on dates. If you get a partner or a girlfriend and you are that boyfriend that is borrowing money off her or can never afford to do anything fun uh, and is always concerned about and in some kind of money pit where he can't get his life together, then yeah, you could say that money counts. But really this is looking at, okay, as a young man throughout history, you needed to find your way to a certain benchmark of where, okay, you could look after yourself and look after a woman. Now these days, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to uh, pay for everything that, and look after her, your children and buy a house and all that. It's like, okay, to date a girl, what does it really cost? It means having a place to be, like your own apartment or a shared apartment, doesn't, you don't, it's totally fine to have housemates as long as they're not assholes that are cock blocking you. Uh, and then you could deal with the basic needs of a couple going doing stuff, going for walks, having a picnic, buying a coffee, having a drink now and then, uh, you know, getting her a birthday present. This kind of stuff is pretty basic level in terms of, okay, I need a wage. And if you have a wage, 
Cool, now you, now you exist in the dating pool when it comes to resources. Above that point, there's not necessarily gonna be that much of an obvious difference to the woman that's dating you in terms of your net worth. Guys that I know that are smart with their money, you know, they moved out of home, they got an apartment, and then they gradually start to accrue wealth. They're not going out as soon as they could and leasing a sports car or buying a Rolex um, or wearing fancy brand names or popping expensive bottles of champagne. No, they're saving it. <laughs> you know, they're putting it in stocks and real estate and crypto and bonds. Maybe they're making gradual upgrades to their living experience, but if they're smart about it and they're looking at their long-term wealth, then they're not going to be blowing everything on a penthouse apartment or you know, leasing or buying assets which are not assets, which are liabilities that de depreciate in value almost instantly. They're not gonna be frittering away their hard-earned cash that they also had to pay tax on, uh, on bottle service. They're gonna be smartly accruing their wealth knowing that, okay, there's life is long and I need to figure out my retirement and I need to, you know, basically set myself up so that at some point maybe I can afford to have a family or to retire. That'd be nice. So when a woman's dating a man, and, and mostly this is going to be during your prime dating years, unless you were born rich, uh, were some kind of crypto scammer early on, or one of the very rare people that in their 20s built a business or luckily bought Bitcoin early or something, where they become seven figure wealthy, the vast majority of people on this planet I mean, they're never going to get there, let's be honest. Most people are not going to be millionaires. It's simply not going to be the case. Best case scenario for many people is that they're going to have to study, work hard during their 20s and probably 30s to possibly reach a point, mid-30s or whatever, where they are comfortable and then maybe can move into wealth if they've been intelligent with what they've earned. So that period of whatever, 20 to 35, which is your prime dating years, if you've got the mindset that if I'm not yet, whatever, multiple six figures or got a million in the bank or whatever's the arbitrary thing that someone told you that you have to have in order to be an attractive prospect financially, I don't yet have that and I'm 22 and at 24, well, you know, I'm, I got a slight raise but I still know any of that and 28, I'm, I'm still not at that. And I've decided that that's the benchmark of what allows me to be with attractive women. Then I'm missing those years, those premium years, which I cannot get back. And best case scenario following this pattern is that in my 30s, maybe 40s, I now have enough, enough wealth, whatever that is, that I've arrived and I've been working out, let's say, the whole time. So I'm jacked, okay, and I um, got my hair transplant and I put some implants in my legs. Um, and I've status, it's a bit confusing, I don't know, Instagram photo, something. I get there and now I'm 42, 43, and now I'm gonna start dating or I'm, that's where I'm gonna really s seriously look at this as a prospect. This is where I'm going to now go, all right, I've arrived, where's my reward? I've seen many, many men do that. It's pretty common. Guys come to me and they were told, study hard, work hard, the girls will come. It was either done in the gangster way, uh, the red pill way, or in the kind of um, well-meaning mother way. You know, just study hard and get a good job and then you'll meet a nice girl that meet a nice girl and pick her up and seduce her? Like, how does that all happen? Ah, it just happens after the job. If you become one of the rare, rare few that become real ballers, right? Millionaires and multi tens of millionaires and so on. Uh, good for you. Enjoy it. Enjoy yourself. Give something back to the community. Help, help the children. Don't just all, just don't just spend it all on Rolexes. It's, that's kind of garish and disgusting. But anyway, whatever. It's your money. Yeah, there, there are worlds where in conjunction with extreme net worth and having a social circle of men who are of that same type, single baller guys that are chasing the dream. And then you put a whole lot of effort, leverage and money into throwing parties, running a modeling agency, having you know big events, getting involved in all those like charity things, rich people charity things, which are basically tax write-offs. Like, okay, positioning yourself in that kind of world, drinking a lot, taking drugs, hiring lots of image models or those party girls who uh, that's their job for a few years in their life. It's like they're part-time models who go and hang out with rich dudes and maybe they eventually hook up with one and date him or marry him because he's got cash. Okay, there is a world where that sort of stuff exists. I've been uh, involved in it. I've been on the inside of that kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of fun to dabble in when someone else is paying for it, but it's not a life that I would like to lead uh, permanently. And it's one that is based purely on smoke and mirrors. 
the women that are in those scenes are not interested in the men per se. They're interested in the lifestyle, in the, in the stuff they can get out of it. Fair enough, whatever. You're a hot young thing and you want to get flown around on private jets and get handbags bought for you and uh, occasionally you'll bang one of the rich dudes in the scene to keep your place. No judgment. You go, sis. But that's not the type of relationship or woman that I'm necessarily wanting to get involved in. So it's like, firstly, you'll probably never get there. I don't want to destroy your dreams of wealth. But this, these are just the realities. Most people are going to have a job and they're going to earn. And if they improve in their job, they'll get more. And if they're smart with their money, they will be able, to, hopefully, I mean, will does any of this young generation, are they going to be able to buy a, a house when it costs a million bucks in an Australian suburb or whatever? Okay, maybe. Maybe you're going to have to be renting forever. This is not kind of exactly my wheelhouse. But it's harder than ever. And it's not necessarily because... Feminism somehow led to this. There's a whole bunch of e economic changes that have happened as the rich get richer, finances get consolidated into wealth funds, uh, zero hour contracts, gigification, destruction of workers' rights. You know, there's a whole bunch of economic reasons why things are getting harder. But okay, let's say best case scenario that you work and you improve and that you're smart and you position yourself well and you're smart with your resources and you invest in ways that where you don't lose it all in some Ponzi scheme or whatever you're still never not going to reach that echelon. And if you're waiting for that forever, then you're going to miss out on all of the other stuff, which is mostly free or cheap, right? It's cheap to approach women and go on dates uh, and have sexual adventures and feel like a, a man and have fun and fall in love and then break up and feel sad uh, and then do it all again. Those are pretty human things that are accessible to most people. And the benchmark of access is not to do with your net worth. Right? It's to do with your balls, actually. It's to do with your bravery, your confidence, and social skills, which if you waited until you were 42, in best case scenario, you hit it the big time, uh, you've got a lot of catching up to do. And not at the best time in, of life to do it, because all of your mates probably are coupled up and have kids by then, or they're not, people are not out being social all the time, or you've got way more responsibilities and obligations. Uh, you have less energy. There are, you know, you're not as horny and as driven. Those things change with time. Of course, taught many men who've come to do this in their 30s and late 30s and 40s, and yep, we can get started and we can catch up. But it's a bit of a tragedy, really, when you look back on the prime years of your life, from let's say 20 to 40, and you miss them because of a promise and a lie. The promise being that if you get XYZ, eventually the girls will come. Uh, and the lie that that's the only stuff that matters, which is a convenient lie because it allows you to not take any real personal risks. This fear that men have of approaching and being rejected is pretty much ubiquitous and vastly like outsized to what the actual risk is. And we all kind of understand this logically. We know that logically it's risky to cross the road, which you do feeling generally feeling very confident about it, than it is to go up and talk to a girl. That the worst thing that's gonna happen is she's going to just say no to you in some kind of way. Whether it's a fuck you or it's a, I'm sorry, I'm busy, it's the same thing. It's just She's just going to remove herself from your life. That is the worst thing that will actually happen. Trust me, I've, I've watched thousands of approaches. There's, I've never seen a boyfriend punch anyone or the cops arrest anyone or anyone get me too'd on the street or anything like that. No, the worst thing that happens is a girl goes, no thanks. And that's a mortifying prospect to, to most men when they haven't experienced enough of it to see that, okay, it's not personal, it's not a big deal. And so... They will find almost any other way to, to avoid that and to still try and get what they want through the apps, through uh, you know, hitting on coworkers, through the, I'll just keep working on this stuff in isolation, which is my finances, my looks, and, and my status is still, we'll deal with that one in a moment. Then I'll eventually get women. And you probably won't just based upon that. And that's a bit of a tragedy because you spent your entire life working for something that you may not get. When you can take the, what is actually the easy road, the shortcut, and just start learning now at age 21, 26, 29, 31 or whatever, better, younger. And then all along the way, even when you're broke, I was broke until I was 30 something, 31 or two. Uh, broke in the sense that, yeah, I could just, just afford to pay rent and feed myself and nothing fancy. And you know, I, would, I would save up for a year to do a really cheap trip overseas to go training or whatever. So I was you know, pretty poor uh, until I was 31, 32. And during that time, I had sex with lots of women. I had amazing love affairs. Uh, I had all sorts 
of adventures. And I got to live at certain points like a rock star or like a millionaire or the, or the image of that without being either. Although I did play in a dorky funk band and played the flute and did I get laid off that twice with not particularly hot chicks. So, you know, I wasn't famous. Not famous enough to get the girls. So regards to money, the conclusion is, yeah, sure, chase, chase money because we need to, we need to survive. Uh, don't let me crush your dreams that I say you're not going to be a millionaire statistically. Well, you, some of you will be, um, but many will not. And that there is still a fulfilling life out there that can be had that the benchmark of what makes the difference financially is, yeah, okay, if you're at that point where you can't move out of home, you can't afford to buy a lunch, then yeah, that does need to be sorted out. Make it a priority, and if it means for a certain period in your life where you just gotta grind, where you gotta work overtime, or whatever the thing is that you need to, to take yourself from that kind of out of the game poverty line to, okay, I'm a functional man that can pay his bills and can catch a taxi somewhere if I need to sometimes or get from A to B and take a girl out and not to be worried about the 10 bucks to pay for the coffees. Cool, yes, that's important. After that, what's most important is what you're doing socially, seductively and with your sense of self. Fortunately, I can help you to speed up this process massively. I wanna tell you about my upcoming course which is called the Five Principles of Natural Seduction Brotherhood. This is a six month mentoring course with myself, which helps to move you through the beginner's hell. The early stages of this, as I was talking about before, many men avoid this their entire lives, primarily because they're worried about their ego getting dented, of being rejected, of it not feeling very nice. And so they find other ways to distract uh, themselves or to work on things that are not necessarily as effective. Anything they can do to avoid the necessity of going over and talking to a woman. That's why guys come to me to train with me because I teach them how to do this in a way that is structured, although it is adaptable to your own personality, that is something that you can implement immediately and start getting results very, very quickly. However, what I've also seen is that often guys struggle in the short term to mid term in terms of keeping momentum and consistency. It takes some time and effort. When I first got into this, I spent about a year kind of doing nothing else, right? I was just approaching every day, going on dates all the time, researching, working on my game, constantly. Now, not everyone can do that you know, full time, but it, it took enough time that if I just done it for a week, a weekend or a month or something, then that skill would have fallen away. So what I've done is developed a six month ongoing mentorship program where you'll get access to me through live webinars, through daily check-ins with the Telegram group. You can also send me recordings of your infield uh, interactions, and then I will analyze them, break them down into minute detail and give you feedback and areas to improve so that you know the, what your blind spots are and you're not just repeating the same mistakes over and over and a huge bunch of amazing bonuses. So stay tuned for the launch of this ongoing mentorship program on the 13th of July. I'm also going to be holding a free webinar on the 11th of July where I'll be going over the, basically giving you an introduction to the five principles, what they are and how to apply them in your seduction life and you can ask me any questions that you wish. So this is a chance to get on the old Zoom with me and have a chat. If you want to sign up for this free event then just click the link in the description. We'll send you out all the details for the Zoom call and stay tuned for the launch of this amazing program coming up on the 13th of July. Lots more content in the lead up. And now back to the video. And finally, we move on to the idea of status. Is status an important factor? Yes, but it's important to understand what that actually means because the kind of cartoonish version that is presented out there is, as we've described already, primarily related to financial wealth. I have status symbols, symbols of wealth, symbols of achievement, fancy car, nice watch, penthouse apartment, uh, you know, on the yacht with the bros kind of thing. This is like an exemplar of someone who has money and, and has surrounded themselves with symbols that say you have money, basically. Then the idea is that you will get respect from other men, that you will have power over people, and that women will be kind of magically drawn to you because you have these external trappings of a man who has status. Does that kind of thing exist? Yes, we've talked about this before. There are subgroups of people out there who their entire game in life is that they've got fancy shiny things around them and that they have sycophants or people who are paid to hang around them to make them look good or look cool and that that will somehow kind of bamboozle women into thinking they're amazing and powerful and important and then want to have sex with them. And that's kind of it. That's the simple equation. It's, it's still so reductive like, when I think about it. Looks, money, status. Like not one of those things has any relationship to the man, like to the individual person, like not even hinting at it. 
What's he, what's this guy like? Is he is he fun to hang out with? Is he you know is he a good bloke? Does he know what women like? Can he fuck well? Can he have a joke with somebody? Do you want to hang out with him? Do you want to spend? Do you feel like at ease with him? Do you feel chill? Like none of this stuff is even looked at. It's just these bare boned external metrics. So no, in this sense. Trying to develop that exemplar or that avatar of status, uh, I think it's primarily a losing game. Again, most people are not going to get there or they're going to fake their way there. Right? You can do that. You can do a fake version of that. You can rent everything. Plenty of those influencers uh, who are selling you get rich quick things don't even own the car. They just rented it and then filmed 30 videos of themselves going here in my garage or whatever. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're not even, they're not even actually rich, but you can fake your way through it. Maybe, but what is the, what is the long-term outcome of this? I'm going to live this life of smoke and mirrors where I'm a, a baller dude who's riding around in his car with his friends who think he's awesome and give him mad respect because he's got more money than them or something, something, right? This is a, you know, a really kind of childish view of masculinity. It's the young boy putting the post poster of the uh, Ferrari and the bikini model and the millions of dollars or the the vision board version of that where you put them all on there and then you like just will it into action. I believe in the secret cash. And there's plenty of people out there who want to take your money and scam you based on those simplistic ideas. So this type of status I don't think is worth working towards. Uh, it's not all it's cracked up to be unless you're of a particular character type in a particular industry uh, and that's your world. Cool. Do your thing. But status means so many other things. Status in terms of what's going to actually make a woman attracted to you who's not part of that you know, particular type of lifestyle is more related to what is her experience of joining your life going to be like. Right? So if she's going to sleep with you, date, date you casually, end up being your girlfriend or your significant partner or whatever, does your life enrich hers? A man with, let's say, no status would be a man who doesn't really have any friends Okay, he might have a job, right? So he might be doing totally fine. He might have his own place. Um, but he doesn't have anything going on outside of his work. Maybe he's got muscles too. But he doesn't have a social world that she can integrate into and benefit from. Unfortunately, a lot of these lone entrepreneur types who are pitching this hustle culture all the time completely neglect this area. And again, I've taught guys who are really well positioned financially. They're self-made. They get to live lives of incredible freedom, but they don't really have any friends. They spend all day working on something online. They may have friends of convenience or let's say tactical collaborators, people that they do business with or maybe even put on, you know, kind of these uh, smoke and mirrors shows or social events to try and get girls in. Okay, that may exist, but they don't really have a crew. They don't have a position in any given subculture. Status in terms of what's actually useful is having friends who respect you and like you that are also fun to be around for a woman, preferably with a mixed group so that there are other females within the group and that it's an enjoyable experience based possibly on certain common factors or common interests, right? So it might be scene related, related to a music scene or a, or a style or an ideology or a way of living, you know, whether you're a, a hipster going out to uh, gallery openings and retro rock nights uh, and you've got two cool friends. And by cool, I don't mean really cool. I mean, people who are, are at ease with themselves. That's what cool actually is. You can put on the affectation of being cool, but people who are at ease with themselves, who enjoy the fact that they're alive and that they are in interacting with their social circle, two of them and maybe one other female friend, and you guys do some stuff. You go for a bike ride, you go for a picnic, you go out sometimes, you go and see a show, uh, you invite each other over for dinners and movie nights. Like this is all really simple stuff. It's not expensive stuff. It's very human, basic community stuff. And a woman who meets a man who hits her benchmarks of attractiveness, and again, remembering that this is not just genetic looks, that he has a style, that he, he's able to present himself, that he can communicate well with her, that he has, she perceives him to be sexy. Money in that, okay, yeah, he's got his own place and he's not borrowing cash off me to pay rent. Cool. And has a life of some sort, right? Has a few friends that are not losers that are cool, cool in the sense that they're enjoyable to hang out with. And then when she gets integrated into his world, it could be that small and that can be more than enough status, right? She's like, I got a boyfriend. He's got some mates. One of them irritates me a bit, but they're 
they're friendly to me and they're not disrespectful douches and they've got each other's back they respect each other he's well liked he's well respected by his peers uh, and we do some stuff together and I enjoy it and he fucks me well more than enough like way more than enough because a lot of women will really struggle to, to find that combination and you can see that that doesn't require me grinding for 15 years to magic to reach this magical specific number one day down the path it doesn't require me doing 4d chess to you know claw my way up extremely difficult hierarchies of power and dominance uh to then position myself finally in the booth with the chicks and the pop in the bottle to like have status that then something something girls just like want to come and fuck you it doesn't require any of that it requires what like when i you know one of the first speeches that i ever gave uh to the world the three pillars of what was it called <laughs> the three pillars of seductive success i think yeah that's it uh my i had three pillars and they were not first you get the money then you get the status then you get the looks then you get the women no it was in a game out of game lifestyle design right those were the metrics that i uh defined way back in the day and still stand by absolutely today we need to work on our inner game. Well, what does that mean? It means your charisma, your confidence, your character, your experience, right? That is the developing the actual man that is going to be interacting with the actual woman as opposed to the clip-on suit, bling, external things that like, hey, like I'm a guy who's made it. I'm of worth now. I'm of value because I have some stuff. No, it's the who's the guy she's going to be actually be spending time with, that she's going to be having conversations with, that she's going to be snuggled up with, uh, that she's going to be, you know, having fights and makeups and uh, adventures with, like his character, who he has developed himself into, which you don't do by sitting at home reading how-to books on anything. Uh, it doesn't just appear overnight. It comes as an accumulation of your life, li life and lived experience. Another reason why you should get started as early as you can in terms of developing your character, becoming an interesting person, becoming an interested person, someone who is fascinated and curious about others, because that's another part of this avatar of this high status guy is that he's a bit of a dick he doesn't care about other people it's his road or the high road uh you know he's arrogant he's he's looks down on other people I'm not saying that everyone who's rich is in this case but you get this snapshot of this person who don't give a who doesn't give a shit about anyone it's all about me i got all the money and the status and the bitches and whatever like it's such a <laughs> caricature of what uh, an actual cool sexy guy is again it's very much an adolescent fantasy and no surprise that a lot of lost adolescents now are being attracted to that kind of person. We all, you know, do I need to say the names? We know who they are, who are selling that. If, you, if you're not as rich as me, you're a loser. If you don't have a supercar, uh, if you read books, because I'm too smart to read books, uh, though the pirate said, that, <laughs> you guys have seen that tape clip, right? Like you couldn't even, you couldn't do a parody of it. I'm, I'm trying to now, but it's just like, he just says it the absolute amazing parody that he thinks that books are like what's a book it's got pirates in it pirates yeah no i've got <laughs> supercars banging bitches popping bottles like boom i'm a man who's making moves come on guys that's there's there are other ways to live so there's your inner game okay that develops over years of experience of meditation of self-inquiry of therapy of psychedelics of going on adventures of interacting with people from of all different types and learning how to uh connect with them it's the lived experience, which you don't get that much of if you only study and stay in one job and don't and don't have any friends and don't travel and don't put yourself out of your comfort zone and don't take the risk of walking over to a random female and having her reject you, right? So you become, you stay very, very sensitive, unable to deal with criticism, rejection, uh, or your ego being dented in any kind of way. The guy that is approach many women that has been on flawed and failed dates the guy that's had relationships good and bad and dramas and psychos and uh, made mistakes like this all builds your inner game right it builds the man that you actually are second pillar is out of game right so that is developing the social and seductive skills because i guarantee i can guarantee this that they trump the wealth and the status almost every time yeah, if you combine a bit of that, you know, you got a bit of bling, you got a bit of extra, you've, you're well positioned in, in a, a social scene, right? So outside of the base level, which is like, I got three mates and they're cool and my girlfriend likes them uh, and we do some stuff together and it's fun. That's, that's achievable, achievable for everybody. It's going to require you going and making some friends and, you know, the basics of having a community. 
Okay, so we, can ex we can extrapolate that out to levels. Sure, I could become a guy who has higher status within a certain social grouping. Again, this is not n needed to be done through domineering and through money. It's like I organize something. I'm going to hold a party. I've been throwing parties since I was 17 years old and I had no money. And uh, we got streamers and uh, fucking I hired a smoke machine and someone brought some lights and we had a stereo uh, and we made invitations and people came. And when they came, I was kind of the coolest guy in the house because it was my party. All right, so I had status transitionally for that particular event. Uh, and then, yeah, sure, okay, I might get some more attention from women or they might, might make it easier on me if I still take the steps. Because this fantasy of like, you know, you have the cool, cool baller party and then the girl sidles up to you and goes, so, your apartment, huh? Mm-hmm. I see you put on, I see you got some lights and, uh, you know, a keg of beer. It doesn't happen. If, if It rarely happens. If it does, it's, the, it's not the girl that you want. However, if you rock over and say, hey, I haven't met you before. And welcome to my place. What's your name? And you're looking awesome tonight. And I have the social skills, the outer game to be able to leverage that. Then, yeah, having, you know, layers or levels of status on top of that works fine. And remember that, like, within every single social echelon, like, you go to a bush doof or or a hippie festival, there will be guys who've got mad status there, right? But it's not, if they rolled in on, in a Rolls Royce and they were wearing, uh, you know, Versace, they would be laughed out of there. They, have, they adjusted. They're a guy who's got a teepee, yeah, and some bean bags, uh, and some magic mushrooms, uh, and some chocolate, right? And a bean bag, uh, I already said a bean bag, two bean bags, and a sleeping, like, he's got the setup, and he's got a couple of cool friends and uh, they've got a sitar player who sits in their tent with them. Okay, that's, that's like a, an encampment that has higher status than the guy that's in the uh, tiny little tent and uh, doesn't know anybody there, right? So within every echelon of society and subculture across the board, there will be people who've got higher and lower status, but mostly that's gonna be to do with their social skills, right? Where they position themselves that people wanna hang out with them, that they have access to something, some fun, some experience, that uh, other people don't have access to, then yeah, okay, women within those groupings may well be attracted because that's the world they live within. She's not, she doesn't give a shit about the status of the guy in Dubai on the yacht because that's not her world. It makes no sense to her. It looks tacky and disgusting for some types of women and vice versa. So yes, you can work on developing status, but be tactical about it and think about in this world, because if I'm just trying to like claw my way up in the Wall Street hierarchy, for example, the best case scenario is I have a bunch of cutthroat dudes who are a bit afraid of me or trying to take me down, but there's no women or fun within that world, right? Or there's lots of crews that I've worked with where they've got high status within a grouping where there's not really any women around, or if they are, they're hangers on or gold diggers. So it's like, okay, social scenes where there's dancing going on, where there's fun, where there's creativity, where there's movement and travel and adventure, where there's yoga, where there's hiking, uh, where there's, you know, mixed events. like. In Portugal, I sometimes go to this night that's a board game night. Bear with me. People are like, okay, grandpa. But it's actually way fun. It's really cool. Because these couple of uh, Ukrainians who moved there organize this night for expats once every two weeks where they go to this bar. The bar gives us, gives us a bunch of the area. You have a drink, you eat a burger, and you play fucking card games and board games. And a whole bunch of really interesting people and sexy people turn up because it's like something to do that's social. It's a bit nerdy, but it's very uh, inclusive. And it's for people who are kind of lost puppies from around the world. And that couple are like, have got mad status within that, right? They have like a broad social circle because they went to a bar and said, hey, you're not using that back room on Thursdays, right? Cool. Can we just have a bunch of people come in and we'll buy some drinks? And they organized it and they became the kings of that scene. I'm so jealous of them. I wish I could be them. It's amazing. Right, so like with a bit of creativity, people like people are not as cool as you think they might be. Like I think a lot of guys expect that a woman needs glamour, right? Like she needs the an Ibiza club worth of cool shit going on for her to like give you the time of day. Yeah, there's some women who that's their world and they exist within and that's true. But for many others, coming and playing a board game or having a picnic or going for a, a hike uh, or having a dinner or a movie night or whatever, it's fine. As long as the people are fun and it's an enjoyable, it's, the social experience is enjoyable, the thing we're doing doesn't need to be fancy or glamorous at all. Right, so that's where the third pillar comes in, lifestyle design. Yes, you can 
you could have ambitions to build this to a global network. I certainly did, right? My ambitions in terms of lifestyle design in early days were based around me playing music and having a band and being part of the that kind of hipster hippie funky scene in various cities in Australia. Started throwing you know big house parties, events, costume events. Uh, started doing collaborative stuff overseas, building business, you know, blowing this out to some kind of mad international level. And that's because I wanted to. I wanted to see how far I could push things and I wanted to be mobile. I wanted to explore the world in the process. Cool. You can do that kind of thing. And I've taught people the strategies to do this many times. But it can start very small and it can accelerate very quickly within whatever city you're in, as long as it's not a 100 person village probably, to build a lifestyle that has enough status that when women come into it, that they are attracted to you. And then how do they come into it? Once again, they're just not going to come into it, rarely. Although, you know, it's funny, when I look back on my hipster years in Melbourne, there's a number of guys that stood out to me that, that were players within their scenes, and they got a lot of action with girls. And really what they were, were of different types, but they were like kind of a hipster twinky dude who was like a bit skinny and like even on the edge of effeminate, but was in a social circle that had was all mixed, you know, straight, female, queer, everyone in together, lots of girls, and then they would be doing fun, creative stuff, and that guy would just be at those things, and he was always, they're always dating someone, they always had a, had a girlfriend. <laughs> like, people that did, did not meet, meet, meet the uh, benchmarks of looks and money, nowhere near, uh, and baller status, of many guys that I have met who have that, all that, and, the, and that, and that, uh, and struggle. Right, and come to me and they're like, yeah, well, you know, I spend so much time working and I spend so much time hanging around other business dudes or other tech dudes or other entrepreneurs. And, you know, I go, I go to these things and we spend the money and there's the girls there, but then, uh, you know, and occasionally I sort of bump into one or something. They're just living in this dating desert, even though they have all these very difficult things to build over long periods of time in place that are expensive. And then you got the just hipster twinker dude who just goes to the, to the, falafel night that they have once a week at someone's place and then just goes and chats to the girl and says hey do you want to come and like listen to this Grateful Dead album in my room uh, and then they bang him all right so yes work on your status as a symptom of you developing a better life for yourself that is more enjoyable right that has more friends and more events and things to explore and things to learn uh, and then draw women into it how do you do that they're like looks money status no it's going to always come back to your outer game skills, which are built upon your inner game foundations. If you got the ability to roll up to a stranger and say, excuse me, lady, fill in the gaps. You look great today. I saw you from a, whatever. The simple, pretty simple day game steps. Remembering the day game doesn't just mean running up and down Oxford Street in London or uh, Fifth Avenue. It's any time I leave the house that I have the ability to go and have a good shot with a stranger, ask her out, I don't need any of that other stuff. I don't even need any status. I have no status when I'm out day gaming. None. This is my bling. It's a little rainbow thing I got at, a, at an ayahuasca ceremony. I just dress well, groom myself, present myself as best as I can. I got no status. They don't know if I've got money or not. Um, okay, I look the way I look. You know, I'll have advantages over some. I'm old now, so I'll have disadvantages to the younger ones. And I'm hotter than some and less than others and whatever. Uh, presenting myself and then Drawing women into my social orbit, that works really, really well, right? So I ask a girl out, okay, maybe I do it as a private date, and then I ask her to come and hang out with me and my friends because we're going to the bathhouse or we're cooking dinner tonight or whatever we're doing. She comes into my world and sees, oh, wow, this guy has mad status with his buddies in that he's respected and it's fun being around him and they're, they're a cool group. They're people I enjoy being around. Yeah, then I have more than enough status to you know, keep that girl attractive. But none of it would have happened if I didn't just grab my balls in my hand and walk over there and shoot my shot. At the end of the day, the things that make the difference, the things that make her decide, yes, I'm attracted to him and I want to fuck him, ultimately is going to come down to your ability to make her feel sexy, to make her feel seen and heard, to listen to her, to be able to be challenging Right, to not be a pushover, not be a super nice guy, but not to be an arrogant dick, to be able to elicit emotion from her, to be able to make her feel turned on, to create sexual tension, to lead, right? So that means to take her on some kind of adventure. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean ordering somebody around. It means that you have a plan 
that you have masculine forward momentum that she can follow along with and add to, that you can fuck her well and keep her sexually satisfied, and that you can handle her longer term if you want to get in a relationship, that you can handle her moods, that you can uh, stand up for yourself, that you can also compromise, that you can understand what actually makes a woman feel good, loved, cared for, fucked well, at the same time as build, developing her respect for you so that she doesn't feel like she can wrap you around her finger. Right? These are the fundamental aspects that make you attractive. Or chasing the external is totally relevant and a positive thing to do as long as you're doing it for the right reasons and you're doing it in conjunction with developing your core character and your ability to interface with the world. Sure, go out there, conquer the world, get rich, buy a super fancy car if that's what you're into, but that will not get you the girls. It will probably won't even make you happy. All right, but if, it, if that's part of your achievement goals, then cool. But I would highly recommend against focusing on solely that for 10, 15 plus years if you're really honest with yourself and you're like, why do I want all that stuff? Well, is it because you know, I want to set goals and achieve them or is it because I feel unworthy and I feel like I don't have much to offer and I don't feel that women would or people would like or respect me unless I had all this shiny stuff to impress them? If that, and be honest with yourself, like that's, and that's not a shameful thing to admit, like it's a very, very common motivation. I know I was motivated early on not to make money, but to get good at seduction because I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to be sexy and likable and I wanted chicks to like me and I didn't want to be a dork forever and, and I didn't think I was worthy and cool enough and I wanted to prove that I was. Okay, and so that was a motivation for a period of time. It was kind of an immature motivation, but it got me moving. Cool, whatever gets you started. If what gets you started going to the gym is hatred of the cool guys or jealousy, right, or self-loathing, okay, those are not motivation strategies you would want to use for the rest of your life. Like, I hate myself, so I'll push myself to my absolute breaking point, you piece of shit loser, and that's going to be how you motivate yourself forever? No. Maybe, okay, maybe that worked initially, where you're like, come on, you fat piece of shit, just get to do, do the things. And then after a while, you're like, yeah, I can do this. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm not a fat, fat piece of shit. I'm just a, you know, a, a, a round gentleman who's working on his goals. And, and then, you know, you adjust your encouragements, internal encouragement strategies, and they develop and mature. Okay, fair enough. But if that, if you are honest with yourself and you say, okay, really what I'm trying to do is compensate for a feeling of lack or a feeling of not having high self-worth, welcome to being a man. That this is pretty common for us, especially in our younger years, that we don't, we haven't made it. We don't know who we are. We don't feel like we're worthy, and uh, we have to go on a journey to to reach a sense of actualization. Awesome, do that. But understand that that is a multifaceted pathway, and there are much more immediate and easier, and I would say much more nourishing things that you can get by working more on these social skills and on the personal personal development, your own personal development. And again, like, I don't even like saying those words because it just conjures up going to a Tony Robbins thing or variation upon and reading self-helpy books and saying affirmations. Like, self-development is kitsch, it's cheesy, and it's, it's often compensatory. I mean, in the real sense, to actually, to have developed one's self, to experience life you know, as a multifaceted experience, to push your limits, to explore, to, be, to remain curious, uh, to not niche yourself only in one set of thinking and ideology, uh, to be willing to have your beliefs and your assessments about yourself challenged and, re and upgraded all the time. Like there's so much that goes into this developing of self and going out and learning how to have fun, which is not easy. I'm not a naturally fun person. I had to study the, study the art of fun for a long time before I could be <laughs> become someone who occasionally has some fun. You know what I'm talking about. You know what it's like. Some people just seem to have it. It's like they're just doing fun like it's no big deal. No, fun is work. Fun is pain. <laughs> okay, so to, to learn to be loose enough, to be relaxed enough, to not take yourself or the world so seriously, to seek enjoyment and joy in the little things in life that bring those being with good people, eating good food, listening to music, traveling, being in nature, you know, saying jokes to each other and all that kind of stuff that I've heard is fun through the process of this self-development, then yes, you are a much more attractive prospect for a woman, many women, because what's it like to be with you is the ultimate question you should ask about how, like where do I fit on the sexual market? If I'm a cunt or I'm boring 
or I'm uptight or I'm stilted or I'm an absolute workaholic and I've got a nice car and cash or whatever. Like in some fantasy world, you might get the girl into your life, but she's not going to stick around because it's not enjoyable to be with you. She's not, again, she doesn't necessarily need glamour and constant stimulation, but like, is it fun to chill with you and watch something on a screen? Is it enjoyable to go for a walk and get a coffee with you? Is it fun to have chats about topics uh, and have a bit of an argument about something and then fuck and make up, right? Like all, all of these and many other aspects of like, what's the interplay between you and the woman? That's what's really going to make the difference. So I think I'll leave it there for today. If you've been following this uh, meme or idea that it's looks money status and nothing else counts, forget about that. Present yourself as best you can. Get the hair transplant if you want to. Heard it's cheaper and it's okay to do it in Turkey. Yes, develop your finances enough that you can look after yourself and then start enjoying being a 22-year-old guy who can just pay the rent and can afford to go out once a week for a cheap meal and can buy a coffee now and then and then go and date some girls who are whatever of that age range who are quite happy to have that guy in their life because he makes them feel good because he fucks them well because it's fun because she wants a boyfriend and this is my boyfriend. And yeah, he's got a job and he doesn't have much money, but I enjoy being around him. And then, okay, as life goes on, you become more established. Your avatar or your archetype of what you're presenting to the world will differ. And cool, maybe you reach points where you have quite a lot more resources and that gives you certain levels of freedom. Means that you can travel more. Means that, yeah, you can maybe take women to certain experiences that they wouldn't get to experience otherwise. But be careful of that because you can easily end up buying her affection or trying to impress a woman. You know, I've got cash now, but I still do pretty simple stuff, mostly on dates or when I'm with girlfriends. And if I have a girlfriend and I want us to go for a trip somewhere, then yeah, cool, I can do that. I've got flexibility of time, flexibility of finances. Yes, that makes life easier. There's, there's more things that we can do, but not so many more. Plenty of guys are just working average dudes who can look after themselves and can afford to have some fun once they've learned how to do it. And that is more than enough because the other stuff is going to count far more. The charisma, the confidence, the social abilities, the empathetic abilities of understanding, like what does women's actually like and enjoy? What do they want? How do they want to feel? And how do you become the man that gives them those feelings? Most men don't know how to do it. And it's not that hard to do. It requires experience. It requires putting yourself out there. It requires uh, bravely facing the inevitable rejections that you will get. And remembering that rejections are awesome actually in the broad scheme of things because they show you that you are kind of bulletproof. They show you that you're not so fragile. They show you that it's not personal, right? It's not, it's not that one person can determine your value and your worth and can delete you from the gene pool or whatever. It's just like people have got preferences, people have got moods. You'll, in, you'll interface with some where they love you or where they think you're okay and then they learn to love you. Others who just want to blow you off immediately and that's all part of it. Pretty rapidly starts rolling off you uh, like water off a duck's back because when you've experienced enough times, you see it's, just, it's just, just, just the spread of the numbers. It's the way it works. All right. Hope I've helped to dispel some of these myths. Feel free to go nuts in the comments where, because we get these comments where guys are like, don't worry about girls. Just work on, your, work on yourself, build the money and the girls will come. It doesn't, it doesn't really work like that. Yes, build yourself, build your money, but you've got to go and get the girls and don't wait 10 years because in that time, someone else was just some broke dude who's just like, I'm just going to go over and talk to these girls. I don't, have, I, don't have, I don't have this yet. Is that okay? Like, yeah, you just go and talk to them. So I don't need to like have the, like, the speedboat or anything? Is that how a speedboat works? I don't need the speedboat? Nah, you can just go and talk to her and if she wants to fuck you, she will. Like, there's no cost of entry for this thing. Uh, that was me. I was doing that all those broke years whilst all those dudes were working away to now they're finally ready for it. I'm like, too late dudes. I already had my 15 years of sex and now I got a bit of status too. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Once again, reminding you that the five principles of natural seduction brotherhood course is coming out very soon on the 13th of July. This is your chance to work with me personally over a six month period. I designed this to be a pretty lengthy program so that we can work through this beginner stuff. The trepidation, the fear that men have about talking to women. I will be setting you weekly missions. You will be coming back and getting accountability. I will be keeping the guys that sign up to this to task. This is not a passive reception of information type of product. This is a watch the lectures, do the missions. James is on your ass making sure that you're doing it. I don't want guys to sign up if they're just going to be watching it. I want the guys that are like, okay, 
I hear what he says. That sounds good. I like this idea of I don't need to be a millionaire uh, who's jacked in order to get girls. I like the idea that I could just proactively start doing this, but I'm scared or but I don't know how to do this or but I did it a bit and it didn't seem to work because I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You're my guys. So stay tuned for this course uh, coming up 13th of July. Also free webinar on the 11th of July where I'll be giving a brief overview of what the five principles are and how they relate to seduction. And you can ask me any questions that you want. These are, these are always fun. I enjoy having these Zoom chats. They're pretty loose, informal, and you, we can get into whatever topics that you'd like outside the course, uh, the main course stuff. So if you want to sign up for that, link is in the description. Totally free. And stay tuned for more content coming out very soon. The lead up to the five principles of natural seduction brotherhood coming very soon. This is James Marshall signing out. Peace.